Uh, and today we'd like to talk um, about Bayesian neural networks. Uh, so I'll assume that you know some of the, well, many of the concepts, I think, behind Bayesian analysis, but um, if you have any questions, yeah, do just interrupt me at any point. I may not be able to see the chat, so just pick up and I'll, uh, I'm happy to be interrupted uh, at any point. Um, right, yeah, so today we'd like to talk about uh, Bayesian neural networks and to do that, I'll uh, cover three main uh, topics. Uh, we talk about regressions, starting from standard regressions and then going into how uh, neural networks can be used for uh, regressions. Um, I'll talk about classification, and then I'll give you a biased selection of examples of recent studies uh, that uh, I happen to have been involved in uh, using Bayesian neural networks in uh, biological research. Um, so yes, as I said, do interrupt at any point, uh, and uh, otherwise I'll uh, get started. So um, I would like to start with just like a basic model of linear regression, which I'm sure you have already uh, covered in, in the first parts of this uh, Bayesian course. And so in a linear regression, we have a predictor, which we want to uh, relate to um, another variable and then we try we fit a model basically to be able to use this predictor to make a, um, an estimate of, of this other value so for example if we have a diet here like broccoli intake in pandas and then body mass of pandas then we can regress them and uh, try to figure out whether broccoli intake um, correlates with the change in body mass um, so we can write this uh, as an equation where we have the body mass uh, equal to uh, a slope times the predictor, so the diet, uh, plus an intercept. We can also show the same model using these nodes and uh, lines here. The lines here represent coefficients, uh, so the slope and the intercept in this case, and the nodes here represent the input, that is the diet, and the output, that is the body mass in this case. Um, our prediction here in Y will be basically uh, an estimate of Pandas body size plus minus a standard deviation or plus minus an error, which we can also estimate in the model. So under this model, we have essentially three parameters. We have the slope, the intercept, and the error. If we are to fit in a likelihood uh, framework or in a Bayesian framework, this type of model, what would be our likelihood function here? What would I use as a likelihood function? So the likelihood quantifies the probability of observing a specific body mass given my parameters and given my data. What would be our likelihood function in a linear regression? Have you seen this uh, earlier in the course? Anybody who wants to step up? Okay, if not, I'll, I'll go with this, but then you're going to have to tell me everything about the priors. Uh, so a likelihood function here that we can use is, uh, is based on a normal density. So we could say the uh, panda body mass here is normally distributed with a mean centered in my prediction, y, and a standard deviation set equal to the error that we are estimating. So for any given combination of the slopes, uh, of the slope uh, and the intercept and the error, we can calculate the likelihood of our data. So the likelihood function will be basically a probability density function uh, of a normal distribution. So the probability of observing the body mass, uh, pandas body mass that we do observe, uh, given our prediction and a sigma is given uh, by this formula here, okay? And then uh, if I fit this in a Bayesian framework or in a maximum likelihood framework, I will be looking for the slope, intercept, um, and error that uh, in a maximum likelihood framework will maximize the likelihood of observing this panda, uh, this panda body mass. 
if we are fitting this uh, type of model in a Bayesian framework, we are going to have to set up uh, priors on each of the three parameters. Okay, so we have three free parameters. We've got the slope, the intercept, and the error. So we need a prior on the intercept, a prior on the error, and a prior on the slope. For the intercept, we could set if the intercept represents the body mass of a panda that doesn't eat any broccoli or where the broccoli doesn't have any effect, if the broccoli doesn't have any effect. So we could imagine this being some sort of mean body mass of a panda. Then what type of prior could we, prior distribution could we use here for the, for this intercept? Prior is a distribution that should reflect what we know about these parameters, right? So if this intercept here is some sort of mean body mass for a panda, what, what would be a reasonable prior that we could set on this uh, intercept? There is it in the chat, a normal distribution. Daniela. Okay, okay, yes, I'm not seeing the charts, I guess, but uh, could be a normal distribution. Um, it could be also uh, a uniform distribution. It could be actually something informed by the um, empirical knowledge that we have about pandas body size. For example, if we know the pandas are mammals and they are terrestrial mammals, we could define some uniform prior that spans a plausible range of uh, body sizes, right? Body mass. Um, now, what's a good prior on the error, on the sigma, okay? The sigma will be the standard deviation that we use in this normal uh, distribution. What's a good prior for sigma? What do we know about sigma a priori? That being a standard deviation in error. Well, be shy. Maybe we could also try to set up on on a range of the variance that is present on uh, different animals to have an estimate. We could, yes. So if we have some prior information about like uh, um, yes, about like uh, random variance in this body mass, we could use that information. What if we know nothing about pandas at all because we are botanists and we know nothing about pandas? Can we still say something knowing nothing about pandas or animals at all? But is there anything that we can say about a sigma parameter? Can it take any range of values? No, I mean, it has to be in some range that is possible biologically. There wouldn't be 2,000 kilos more or something like that. Yes, that's true. Um, is there anything more general about this sigma? Remember, sigma is this. Uh, uh, oops, is this standard deviation, right, of a normal distribution? What values can sigma take? Animals or not? There will be less than the maximum and and more than the minimum, right? Yes, even more general, maybe. What what? Is there any value of sigma that doesn't make sense here? Minus one. Or any negative value actually. Like a sigma is a standard deviation, so it cannot be negative. Because a negative sigma doesn't make sense here. A negative standard deviation uh, is uh, uh, meaningless. So what we could use here is a prior that will uh, not allow any negative value, for example, a gamma prior or an exponential prior. So any distribution basically that assigns zero prior probability to negative values. Um, and the last parameter that needs uh, that needs a prior is a slope. Um, any idea of what, what prior we could use here for a slope parameter? Mm 
do we have any null expectation on the slope? Did you do Bayesian? Uh, did you do regressions in, uh, in the previous uh, classes? Yes, we did. Um, okay. <laughs> we could like I, I assume there is some idea for what kind of effect you would expect or what association would expect. Otherwise, we could set it to zero if we have no idea, or set the mean to zero. And I mean, maybe caution would would be too strong and to go with the t distribution to have a weaker prior and allow wider tails for instance yes but generally you would use some priors uh some prior distribution that is centered in zero which is your null expectation and a prior that allows both negative and positive values because you can have a positive or a negative uh, correlation right so you could have a normal distribution, a T uh, distribution, Cauchy distribution, doesn't really matter, but uh, essentially it will be something that is centered in zero, which is so something that assigns the highest prior probability to a zero effect size. And then a distribution that allows both the positive and the negative range. Here, for example, I'm using a normal distribution centered in zero with some deviation one. So this would be like a typical setup for a linear regression where we have. Uh, some prior on the intercept, some positive spanning prior on the error, and then usually a symmetric center uh, uh, distribution centered in zero for the slope. So now we have the likelihood, we have the priors, um, and we can run our MCMC, for example, to estimate the parameters of our model. To do that, we'll have a data set which we will now start calling training set because we'll be talking about neural network in a moment. We have this data set where we have a bunch of observations with broccoli and panda body mass. And then based on these observations, we're going to optimize a model and find basically the regression line that uh, maximizes the posterior probability basically. So we will do this in an MCMC and obtain not only a single estimate of our parameter, but a distribution of estimates but let's say that this is uh, the line that we estimate with our posterior uh, estimate of the slope, the intercept, and the, and the error. So our trained or optimized model will look like this. Um, and it will basically tend to minimize right, the distance between the line and the observed pandas. So this model can now be used as a predictive model. So if we are given the diet of a panda, we can make an estimate of the predicted body mass. So if this panda that we haven't uh, uh, managed to uh, measure eats this much uh, broccoli uh, per day, then we can predict its body mass using our regression line. OK, so we can use um, a regression as a predictive model. This is what a linear regression looks like. This is what a multiple regression looks like. So when we have now uh, multiple predictors, for example, we try to estimate uh, or correlate body mass with three different uh, quantities, diet, genome, which could be, I don't know, genome size, for example, or whatever, range size. The equation of this multiple uh, regression looks like this. So we have a single coefficient for each uh, predictor here. And then we sum everything up, and then we have an intercept. Okay, so the predicted body mass is equal to the product between this uh, coefficient and the diet, this coefficient and the genome, this coefficient and range size, and this coefficient times one, which means basically the intercept. We can rewrite this equation um, as a matrix multiplication. Only these matrices are one D, one dimension, so. It's a bit silly to do that, but this will help us understand in neural networks in a moment. So this is basically the same thing as this one, only we write it as a matrix multiplication where we basically do a multiplication item by item here, where we uh, multiply by columns. So the first item with the first column that has a single item here, second, uh, second uh, 
predictor by the second column, third predictor by the third column, and then uh, we sum everything up, and this is going to be y. Okay, we see that these operations will come back when we talk about neural networks. So these are two examples of regressions. These regressions are linear by construction, so they can only uh, infer linear relationships between the predictors and the response, right, and the body mass. Uh, this is fine in many cases. It's uh, what is nice about these models is that these parameters are clearly interpretable because they each correlate a single predictor. But of course, there is some uh, limitations to what a model like this can do, especially if these responses in reality are actually not linear. And this brings us to uh, neural networks. And neural networks, the first neural network that I would like to introduce to you is a neural network used for regression. And we are basically going to uh, walk through the steps of a neural network to understand how this is actually not that different from a linear regression, uh, but it still uh, has a lot more uh, power. But the operations that are going to be needed in um, a neural network are actually very similar to the operations that we just did for the regressions, for the linear regressions. Only here, um, I'm adding here a bunch of terminologies because uh, this is uh, the terms that are used uh, in machine learning. Um, but in a neural network model, we'll have an input, which is basically our predictors. We're going to have weights, which are coefficients or slopes, if you want. Then we have nodes that are kind of intermediate steps that take you be, uh, from the input to the output. We walk through these steps in a moment. So these are nodes, they are just numbers. Um, there is a, an activation function that we will talk about in a moment. And then some more uh, weights, a bias node that is equivalent of an intercept. And then we have the output that is a prediction. So the terminology is slightly different, but uh, we see that the operations are not that different after all. So let's see what this uh, sort of abstract model actually does. Uh, and to do that, we are going to walk through the operations that are needed to go from an input to an output, just like we did for the regression model. So the first operation that we have here is this thing, where we go from a bunch of predictors to a bunch of nodes. These nodes are a numerical representation of the predictors in a different dimension. And it's not numbers that we aim or care to interpret directly, okay? It's just some intermediate step that takes us uh, to the output eventually. What is going on at this step is, again, a matrix multiplication, where we multiply these vector of predictors by a matrix of weights. These are the, each line here is a weight, is a parameter that we eventually will estimate. And uh, the operation that we need to do to go from uh, X and W to Z is a ma uh, matrix multiplication. So to explain this, I'll use uh, real numbers, which hopefully will help. So let's say that these are our starting diet genome and range size. So we got three numbers. And these are our current parameter values. So I'm just assigning, at this point, random numbers to these lines, OK? These are parameters. And th we are going to have to estimate these parameters. In uh, matrix multiplication, so now we need to go basically from these three nodes to these three nodes, okay? But we go through a matrix multiplication to get there. So we first multiply each X value, so each of these uh, predictors, by a W column. So we take this value and we multiply it by these numbers here, and we obtain three numbers that I'm placing here. Then I go to the next value here, and I multiply them by the second column. OK, and I get this column here. And then this is the third uh, the range size, which I multiply by these three weights, and I obtain this other column. So now I went from three numbers to uh, nine numbers, but I want to end up again at three numbers, right? which are these three nodes. So the next step here will be uh, sums by rows. So we have a, we obtain this 2D matrix, and now we take these three numbers here, we sum them up, 
and we obtain the first node, so the first value here. Then we go to the next row, we do the sum and obtain the second uh, value. And this is step seven. Um, so now we've taken these three values here, multiply them by a matrix, so in this case, three by three, and obtain again, three values here. Interestingly enough, I know this is uh, a course using R, but if you are interested in doing this in Python, you can do this operation, this whole set of operations in a single line, in a single function. So this will do exactly this type of operation. Now, this vector that we obtain here, these three values of Z, are a representation of our input data in an abstract uh, parameter space that we don't have to understand. So we are not really aiming to interpret these values. But what is interesting and important to realize is that each of these uh, value here is already a function of all of the three uh, features, okay, all of the three inputs, because they integrate, they are summing up effect sizes basically from all three uh, inputs. Okay, so this also means that this neural network model will be able to account for all possible interactions between uh, inputs. So now we have this uh, set of values. The next step that we are going to, uh, which we can place here, the next step that we need to do is going through this hidden layer um, and we go through an activation function. Again, these are these terminology using machine learning, but activation functions can be actually something, uh, things that are really simple to compute. For example, one of the most used, uh, most commonly used and one of the easiest things to compute uh, is the ReLU function. And this is a, simply a function that will take any negative value and set it to zero, and any positive value and leave it as is. This ReLU function uh, is, is one of the simplest that exists and is still extremely powerful. The whole point of this hidden, uh, of the activation function in the hidden layer is to break the linearity of the response because we want neural networks to be nonlinear or potentially nonlinear. Okay. So the activation function will typically be something that is non-linear. In this case, it looks like this. So everything that is negative is set to zero and everything that is positive stays where it is. We There is um, a whole range of other activation functions that look, for example, sigmoidal. So they are all characterized by being non-linear. Their point is really to make sure that the neural network can account for non-linear responses between things. So going through this step is very simple. We just take every negative value, any value that happened to be negative and turn it into a zero. And then we go to the last step, which looks very much like a multiple regression as we've seen it before. So now we have a vector of numbers. We are adding here this uh, bias node that is uh, the intercept. And we do the same operation basically that we did before. I see there is a question. Uh, yeah, um, I was uh, just wondering how how do you choose which activation function to use? And in your experience, does it matter which, which one you use at, or, or not? I mean, how, how important is it which one you use? Um, um, yes, so that's a good question. We'll uh, we talk a little bit more about uh, selecting the settings of these networks in a bit. So we'll come back to that. Um, ideally, these activation functions will not make a huge difference. Uh, in some cases, uh, especially for small networks, then uh, using a uh, one activation function or another can give you a better answer. In some cases, it's only a matter of convergence. So like you, some activation functions will make the model converge sooner than others. Um, but again, there is no like strict general rule. There isn't like a single activation function that will do the best job everywhere. So uh, it's part of the fine tuning that we'll see later how to do. But generally, models are not extremely uh, sensitive to this type of choice. Uh, yes, Elise, I think you're, uh, you're muted. I'm afraid. Just have one question. Sorry, uh, I'm wondering why you, don't you have the bias node in every layer, just uh, and just at the last one? 
um, you can have bias nodes in every layer if you want. Um, it's just here I'm adding it how you build the, the network, I guess. Yes, it's really it's pretty much like a, a hyperparameter that you can set. You can choose to have uh, bias uh, nodes everywhere, or you can have it uh, only at the last layer, or you can just, or you can also, you don't have to have one, basically. Um, yeah. Um, right. So in the last step, basically, yeah, we add this bias node that is basically similar to uh, an intercept in a in a linear regression. This node will be basically a one that you multiply by its own parameter. Uh, we do this matrix uh, multiplication again. We sum by rows and we end up with one value that is our output and it's our predicted body mass. So you see that basically going from input to uh, output here implies a lot of operations, but they are very simple operations. There are multiplications and sums pretty much. So nothing really uh, very uh, expensive to compute going through this network. And this is good because we have a lot of these operations, right? Um, once we have a predicted uh, body mass, we can calculate the likelihood of the of our panda given our prediction, right? So if our prediction is here and our uh, true body mass is here, this will be the likelihood based on a normal distribution. If our prediction is here, this will be the likelihood. So the likelihood will be higher. Okay, so this likelihood part will work just the same as in a uh, linear regression. So the likelihood function is still the same. We get uh, a prediction and then we calculate the likelihood of our data, which is the observed body mass of a panda, based on this prediction. Okay. So, in a, a Bayesian neural network, we have a likelihood function that is the normal, uh, uh, the, the PDF of a normal distribution, so the probability density function of a normal distribution. And then we have the priors on the weights. Um, there is no strict rule again on which prior you should use on the weights. The standard choice is to use again some distribution centered around zero, assuming that zero means that there is no effect size. Here, the effect sizes are a bit harder to interpret, right? Because there isn't just one effect size linked to every predictor. Um, but um, the typical choice for priors here is. Um, a normal distribution or some other distribution centered in zero. So if we have a likelihood and we have uh, priors, it mean, this means we can compute a posterior. Um, and if we can compute a posterior, we can run any Bayesian algorithm to estimate our parameters. Here, the parameters will be all of these weights, right? And we will um, try to optimize these weights so that uh, the likelihood of our pandas, uh, panda body masses will be uh, the highest, or should you say the posterior. So if we have a training set like this, we are going to have a bunch of pandas for which we have the body size and the predictors. These are a training set. And then we can run uh, our neural network. We can use uh, a posterior sampling algorithm. I'm sure you've come across uh, Metropolis uh, Hastings MCMC or Hamiltonian uh, Monte Carlo algorithms. So these will be algorithms that basically iteratively uh, update the parameters. So you will start with some initial parameters. Basically, you initialize the weights of your network in some ways with random numbers. You will set them in a, if you're using MCMC, basically you will use this as your current parameters, then you will update your parameters using some proposals, right? So you will slightly update the parameter values. You will calculate the acceptance ratio, which will be based on a comparison between the posterior of the new uh, parameter values and the posterior of the previous parameter values. Based on the acceptance ratio, you will accept or reject the new parameter values. And if you accept the parameter values, you will start from that point. If you reject them, you will start back from the initial point and then update the parameters again, calculate acceptance ratio and so on. So 
I'm not going into the details of MCMC because I think you have already seen it in previous classes. But of course, if you have questions about this, uh, do ask. Um, as we sample basically parameter values from their posterior distribution, we will collect them, right? So we will produce a collection of posterior values of our uh, weights, the parameters of a neural network. So if this is our model, we will collect posterior samples of all of these parameters and all of these parameters, right? So these are like the posterior distributions of these parameters. All good so far? Okay. If I now have a distribution of uh, of weights or parameters, basically samples from their posterior uh, from their posterior probability distribution, we can use these weights uh, to make predictions. So if we have uh, broccoli intake, genome, and range size uh, for some pandas, we can predict their body size by running these measurements through our optimized network. And in fact, we can do it many times by every time sampling a different weight here. And if we do that, we are going to obtain a posterior distribution of the predicted body size um, of our pandas. Okay, so we are going to predict uh, pandas body mass based on these three inputs, but accounting for uh, complex relationships between uh, these predictors and the output. And I say complex because it's been shown that uh, if a neural network is deep enough and complex enough, so if it's got enough parameters, it can approximate, in principle, any function. So a neural network, unlike a uh, linear model, will be able to, uh, in principle, estimate any sort of um, response given our inputs. And, any, and, and it will be able to account for any possible interaction also um, between our or among our predictors. So this is pretty awesome. BNNs, uh, neural networks in general are very powerful. So why don't we use them all the time? Uh, of course, neural networks are very powerful, but uh, there is a number of drawbacks. Uh, neural networks are basically by definition over-parameterized models, which means that they have way more parameters than necessary. Um, and this changes a lot like the whole uh, business of model testing. In a likelihood framework, you tend to find the simplest model that best explains your data, explains your data. In this case, you're going to have to use different methods, and we see uh, some of them. Uh, but essentially, there is a risk of overfitting using this model because there are so many parameters. Um, defining priors in a Bayesian neural network is not trivial because uh, these parameters are not directly interpretable, right? They, the parameters themselves don't have a, 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 an interpretable meaning. And that means that it's not as easy as it was for a linear model to make pri to set priors that are informed by some a priori knowledge. For example, for the intercept on uh, on the linear model, we could say that the body size of a or a body mass of a panda has a certain plausible range. So we were using a priori information to define our prior. Here, for these nodes, that's not so uh, trivial. The parameters themselves are not directly interpretable. And therefore, these models are not explicitly designed for hypothesis testing. So there are ways to do hypothesis testing using neural networks, but that's not their main uh, goal. Uh, yes, it's a question. I'm just wondering how uh, crucial it is to have informative priors, because maybe if you train your network for long enough, then you, you'd be able to, to reach uh, uh, um, ways that are adapted to your, to your question? Yeah, so um, 
So informative priors are useful sometimes because uh, in, in some models, if you, uh, if you have a prior information and want to use it, a prior is a good place to do that in a Bayesian model. Here, for example, if we had a priori knowledge about the uh, body mass of a panda, it would be difficult to specify a prior that reflects that. Because the body size, uh, body mass of a panda here does not get its own parameter. I mean, there is this sort of intercept here, but it's multiplied by a bunch of weights that don't really directly relate to any single predictor. So it would be difficult here to set a prior that reflects uh, a priori knowledge. Yes, but if you if you update them accordingly, at some point you, you don't really care about the about the initialization anymore, right? But when I say prior, I don't mean the initial parameter values, but I mean the prior distributions that we use to ah. calculate the posterior. Um, so uh, the prior here would be basically what we used here for the um, parameters of the linear model, which I cannot find anymore. Uh, <laughs> too many slides. Um, so for the linear model, we had these priors, right? With prior distributions on, uh, on our parameters. Mm -hmm. Here we could define priors knowing what we are doing basically because we know what this parameter means this is an intercept which we can uh, imagine to reflect the mean body size of a panda that doesn't eat broccoli or something this is a standard deviation so we know what type of prior we want here we want some sort of prior that uh, assigns the highest probability to our null hypothesis which is no slope basically so zero in the case of a neural network the parameters um, are not directly interpretable, so defining a prior on them uh, is not as trivial. So priors here will be typically centered on zero, but there is, if we wanted to add some extra information, uh, it would be okay. more difficult to do that. Okay, got it. More questions? Um, okay, so the, there is, these are some drawbacks, basically, of doing these types of modeling. Uh, one specific concern is the risk of overfitting. And this, in particular, in machine learning, this is like a crucial uh, point, uh, because machine learning, unless it's using Bayesian neural networks, is using essentially a likelihood uh, approach. And in a likelihood approach, what the typical uh, way to fit a model in a maximum likelihood context is to find the parameters that maximize the likelihood of your data, right? So that's the typical way to fit a model in maximum likelihood. The problem here is that you have so many parameters that if you did that, you would be almost certainly overfitting because you have so many parameters that if you maximized the likelihood of your data, uh, you would find parameters that are perfect for your data, so like perfectly matching your data, but they would have very poor predictive power because the model would be overfitting the data. Um, so what people do in machine learning, which is not Bayesian neural networks, but uh, we'll come back to that, is typically to split your data set into a training set and a validation set. Okay, so you just take your data set and split it into two chunks and you sample your parameters or you optimize your parameters based on the training set in this case you will be minimizing a loss that is basically the, the inverse of the likelihood um, but at the same time as you maximize uh, or minimize the loss or maximize the likelihood on your training set you will also monitor the likelihood or the loss of your validation set so you optimize the parameters on this set, but you also monitor how accurately you do predictions on this validation set. And for a while, this 
two validation and training loss will follow a similar trajectory. So they will decrease or their likelihood would increase. At some point, however, the training loss will continue decreasing, but the validation loss will start increasing, meaning that after some while, the parameters are being optimized toward overfitting the training set. Okay, so the parameters are getting really good at uh, predicting these three pandas, but they start to become bad at predicting these two pandas. So monitoring the validation loss, you can detect when the model is starting to overfit and then basically stop the fitting process. So instead of maximizing the likelihood, you, you stop the optimization at some point. And you will basically stop at the moment where the loss, uh, the validation loss will start increasing. So the optimization stops here and these are the weights of your model. This is in a typical machine learning framework, so not in a Bayesian framework. In a Bayesian framework, the risk of overfitting is more is limited, and it's limited by the fact that you have priors. Um, these priors that you set on the parameters, they are typically centered in zero, and they have a regularizing effect. Uh, I'm not sure if we have seen regularization or Bayesian shrinkage before in the course. So regularization is typically this effect that priors have on like preventing overfitting. Regularization is used a lot in multiple linear regressions as well by using priors on the coefficients that basically uh, reduce the risk of overfitting. Here, having so many priors on so many parameters uh, will effectively um, prevent the a Bayesian neural network from completely overfit to, uh, the data. Validation sets will still be useful in Bayesian neural networks, but they're not strictly necessary here. So you can run your MCMC for as long as you want, and at some point the model will uh, reach a convergence, and that convergence point is likely to be uh, about right, so not really overfitting. Any questions about this? Yeah, can you explain the last part again um, of the of this uh, prior use? Uh, yes, so the priors are used in a Bayesian neural network by uh, basically calculating for every any given value of your weights, you calculate their prior probability, right? Just like you would do for any free parameter in any model in a Bayesian context. So in any uh, Bayesian framework when you have a model like this for any given value of b here you will calculate its prior probability based on this distribution for any given value of sigma you calculate the prior here and any given w value you calculate the prior here the posterior probability will be proportional to the priors so this probability times this times this times the likelihood there is a probability of your data Right, so this is the, yes. the standard Bayesian like construction of a model. In a neural network, you basically have priors on the slopes, right, on these weights. And these priors will uh, have a regularizing effect because they will not allow, uh, they will constrain basically the uh, parameters. So in, in a B, BNN, what we have is a likelihood function that looks like this, and then we have all of these priors applied to the weights. So the weights cannot just go anywhere just to fit the data. They will be constrained by uh, this prior. And the prior will favor weights that are kind of around zero. Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah, so this type of priors is used also in a multiple regression context where you have multiple coefficients and using this type of prior will do regularization in a multiple regression. And similarly, we'll do regularization. Regularization means like you will essentially prevent the model from overfitting. You will do so also in a neural network. Does that clarify? Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Cool. Any more questions about this?
Now, there are many parameterizations that neural networks can take. So we can change the activation functions, as we mentioned earlier. Relu, sigmoid, there are very many activation functions that you can look up online. Uh, they are typically simple things to compute, uh, but they are, and they are always nonlinear functions. Uh, so you can change the activation functions. You can change the number of nodes, right? So this will just increase the number of parameters. You can change the number of hidden layers. This will make them become deep neural networks. Uh, the operations here will still be the same that we did before, right? It's just that you do more of them. How do we choose among these different options? Um, ideally, these different options will not have a big effect on the outcome. So if that's the case, you don't have to worry much about it. In some cases, you can have uh, you can use a validation set, even in a Bayesian network, um, to choose between different architectures of the models. For example, you can have a case where your training set will sample uh, likelihoods that are lower for a very simple model and increasingly high for more complex models, so for models with more parameters. This is not necessarily the case, but it could be the case. Um, but if you then monitor the uh, likelihood samples through your MCMC, for example, in your validation set, maybe you find that this is the distribution that you're sampling. And if that's the case, then this model would actually return the highest um, validation likelihood, meaning that this model is maybe overfitting a bit. So in this case, I would choose this model. This is not, this is just kind of a rule of thumb. It's not really strictly uh, uh, model testing, like explicit model testing. Explicit model testing in the sense of like calculating marginal likelihoods for a Bayesian framework or AIC likelihood ratio tests or these kind of things in a maximum likelihood framework. This type of model testing doesn't exist for neural networks because there are just too many parameters that you would have to uh, basically test. Um, but yeah, so once we choose our best model, we can do predictions and obtain uh, predictive uh, body masses for our pandas, given any combination of broccoli intake, genome, and range size. Um, yeah, so that was all I had for the regression part. Any questions? Do you need a break? Yes, no. Good to go. All right, uh, then uh, let's keep going. The next thing that I wanted to talk about is networks for classification. This time, this will be all a lot easier because we have seen already the uh, neural network as a model. And um, classification is just another type of uh, task that a neural network can deal with. And most of the network network uh, structure will be the same as we had before. So we could have uh, the same input that we had before, the same nodes here. Uh, but our question now is not about predicting the body mass of a panda, but it's predicting whether a particular diet genome and range size is associated with uh, a panda, a brown bear, and a cave bear. Um, so you can see already from uh, the structure here that the model itself is not very different as, except for the last part. So the classification task will be basically to find the parameters here that for any given diet, uh, genome, and range size will assign the highest probability to the correct species. OK? Um, this first part of the network runs just the same as we have seen for the regression model. The second part of the network, uh, or the last part of the network, the output layer, um, is now different. Because instead of predicting a single value here, uh, being the before the body mass of a panda, here we need to predict basically three values, which is a probability associated with each of the three species that our model includes. 
So our model here has to end up with three nodes, and each of these nodes will become a probability. The first one will be the probability assigned to a panda, meaning that these diets, according to these parameters, will be assigned with that probability to a panda. Second probability will be assigned to a brown bear, the third one to a gay bear. Um, so here, instead of having a single node, as we had before, we have now three nodes because we want to end up with three probabilities. And these values here, which will come from you know, propagating the features into the hidden layer and into the output layer, these numbers will have to be transformed into probabilities. But these values can be positive or negative, right? They can take any value. And so to turn a vector of any uh, range of values into a vector of probabilities, we use the softmax uh, function. There is a simple function. Uh, again, you can write it in one line in Python and in R as well. Uh, that turns any number of uh, uh, any vector of numbers into a vector of probabilities. The uh, equation itself may look more complicated than it actually is, but what we're doing here is basically exponentiating each of these values. And then we divide these exponentiated, each of these exponentiated values by the sum of the exponentiated values. When you exponentiate a value, whether it's negative or positive, you will always get a positive value. So then you divide a positive value by the sum of the three values. And so these three values uh, that you obtain sum up to one, basically. Okay, you divide them by their sum, and you end up with three numbers that sum up to one. So they qualify as probabilities. So the only difference basically in this network is this one function here that is called softmax that turns a bunch of numbers into a bunch of probabilities. Now, what's the likelihood function in this model? Before we were using a normal distribution as a, as a likelihood function, the PDF of a normal distribution. The likelihood function in this model is even simpler, is basically the probability mass function of a categorical distribution. The likelihood is already given by these probabilities. So under these weights and this particular broccoli intake, uh, range size and genome, my model uh, gives me a likelihood for this panda of 0 0.11, so 11% 11, 11 probability. By optimizing my model, I'm going to update these parameters, these weights, and I will favor parameter values that give me a higher likelihood for my panda, right? Which will mean that this broccoli, this genome, and range size will be uh, uh, associated with higher probability to the correct species, in this case, a panda. Okay, so again, here I will, I will have a, a training set, so a bunch of species for which I have uh, the predictors and the label, so the species, and then the model will be trained to find uh, the best answer in all of these cases. Again, we have the issues the issue of potentially overfitting, which is clearly a problem in regular machine learning, less of a problem in a Bayesian neural network. In the case of uh, a classification task, overfitting would mean recognizing, recognizing exactly each item in, in your training set, like you do here. But then this would result in a poor predictive power, meaning that if I give the model a data uh, a data set that is different from the training set, then the model will misbehave. So as usual, we want our models not to overfit so that we have better predictive power. This is done using priors as a regularizing uh, uh, function here. Again, we can also do the same approach that we, uh, that we used before. So we can also split our training set and validation set. Um, so we can split our data into these two training and validation sets and then look at the validation likelihood uh, to see which of the different models returns the better, uh, a better likelihood for the validation set. And if a more complex model returns a lower likelihood in the validation set, it probably means that it's slightly overfitting. 
the degree of overfitting here will not be as high as uh, uh, in a regular machine learning context. Now, if we optimize this uh, model for classification, we're going to get a uh, bunch of posterior weights, right? So a distribution of values here, which means that for any given uh, diet, genome, and range size, we can now make predictions and predict whether these observations come from, a, from an individual of uh, these species, these species, or that species. In this case, if the model was trained well, and if the ground truth is uh, brown bear, this diet will be linked with the highest probability, but zero probability to a brown bear. We can get a, a range of predictions basically by running these, uh, the same features, the same uh, predictors, we can run them through the neural network across many of these parameter values. So we get a range of predictions and we can collect all of these predictions to obtain posterior probabilities of, uh, of these features being associated to a panda, a brown bear, or a cave bear. If the model is trained well, it will give us a good answer, the correct answer for most of our data. One of the reasons why Bayesian neural networks are uh, really useful is uh, that neural networks, like non Bayesian ones, uh, tend to be very certain about their predictions even where, when they are wrong. So just looking at these probabilities, which you will get also from a standard neural network, is not really a good way to determine how certain you are about your uh, prediction. Because there is a demonstrated tendency of neural networks to be very confident about their answers, even if they are wrong. And this is a problem if you, for example, feed uh, a model with data that uh, doesn't belong in any of these three species, which could happen. In a Bayesian neural network, because we have this regularizing effect and because we can compute posterior probabilities associated with each class by running the model through a range of posterior weights, when you feed the model with unknowns, so with out of distribution data, Diets, uh, diet, genome, and range size of something that the model has never seen and that is not included in the output, then a Bayesian network will typically give you uncertainty in the outcome. Like, I don't know which of these three it is. It cannot directly tell you it's something else because the something else doesn't show up in this vector here. But it can at least tell you that uh, it doesn't know which one it is. And it will do that by assigning low probabilities, but zero probabilities to all of your classes. So this is a major advantage of uh, Bayesian nets. We can then evaluate the accuracy of our predictions using confusion matrices, which you may have seen before, and calculating the accuracy. Basically, we can take our validation or test set and see how many times did the model get it right or wrong. This is to get an idea of how good the model is, right? So in this case, out of 37, I got 33 that were correct. And that's an 89% accuracy. We can look at the confusion matrix, which will basically tell you for every class, how many of them you got right. So I had 14 pandas in my data set. All of them were predicted correctly. I had 10 bears here in my training, in my data set. And I predicted nine correct and one wrong. And this one wrong ended up in this class. Okay, so this is what the confusion matrix shows. Here I had uh, 13 uh, K pairs and 10 were predicted right and three were predicted wrong. Now it's important to look at this prediction, uh, at this confusion matrix because like uh, high accuracy doesn't always mean that your model is good. And especially this is the case when you have imbalanced data set. In this data set, I had a lot of pandas and very few bears. And so I have a very high accuracy here. But what the model is predicting is basically that everything is a panda. And even so, like you see, you still get a high accuracy just because the, 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 uh, the test set is uh, biased. It's like it includes so many pandas. So it, saying that everything is a panda will still give you a 92% accuracy. 
but maybe the model has not learned anything. So this is something to be careful of. And this is a general uh, issue with supervised learning. So supervised learning means that you train a model based on some observations, and the model will only do as good as uh, the observations allow it to. Um, if you have the chance to experiment machine learning with uh, toddlers, it's pretty amazing because toddlers are basically like untrained neural networks that you can try to try to train. And I did that twice. Um, and and you can see that like toddlers will mistake things uh, in ways that you would not really imagine before. And this is coming from their limited uh, training set because they have not seen everything yet. So they will uh, identify a pigtail as a snake if this was their training set or a, or a half moon as a banana. And so this happens to toddlers and then toddlers know better after a while. Uh, machine learning models also have this type of problem. So they need to be trained properly with proper data sets so that they don't end up giving you answers that don't make any sense. I have I have a question on a previous slide. Please, yes. Um, and I admit that I have not attended the course, so maybe it just comes from limited knowledge. So one, one prior to that, where you have the even one prior, uh, yes, here where you said um okay if um really you have data that is not from any of the three um bear species it will give low posterior probabilities among all the classes so does this mean that they don't need to add up to one oh they will still add up to one so here they ah, will be okay. 33% each. Ah, okay. So you call 33 a low probability. Okay. Then it's Yeah, I mean, yeah, yes. Yeah. Like typically you would say like yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. confident about a zero probability if it's greater than 95%, for example. Right, right, right. So they're so just here all I about basically, equal on, yeah. but but they do need to add up to one. Yeah. Yes, they do. Yes, okay. they do. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. So it's basically up to you to define what threshold you consider significant. You can do this by simulations or you can use some standard cutoff like 95%. But this would be a case where you basically don't know what the answer is. And it's a good thing because the ground truth was that the data come from a different species. Um, more questions? Yeah, maybe one question about the training data. So mm -hmm. how big should it be? What is like uh, normal numbers you normally train on? So yeah, that depends um, on the type of model that you're running. Like if you have a model that is like simple, like this one with a few predictors and a kind of a simple outcome, then you don't need very many uh, uh, training samples. The good thing of Bayesian neural networks is that they scale or that they adapt well to small data sets because they have these priors, they, you get post zero probabilities. So even if you have a small training set, uh, that's okay because the um, model will basically give you more uncertainty on your predictions. So you don't risk basically uh, getting very confident and very wrong answers. That's why Bayesian neural networks are particularly useful for small data sets. Uh, meaning like, I don't know, like a few tens of these observations would be enough to, to train a model. And it really depends on how many is uh, on how many parameters you have and uh, yeah, how complex you build the model. Obviously, if you if your data set is small, you won't go for like many hidden layers and many nodes. You will tend to go for simpler neural nets. Um, but in a BNN, usually you will get a quantification of the uncertainty in your predictions, whether it's a classification task or a uh, regression task, uh, just the same. So even in, in a regression task, if your training set is small, then you will have a wide uncertainty interval around your prediction, right? Um, so that's good. In a regular neural network, then you would need more data set, more training 
data typically to get uh, decent predictions because you have fewer ways to quantify the uncertainty that you have. Okay, so if I understand you correctly, the main difference is that, that normal neural networks, they, they, they really try to give you a precise answer and while in Bayesian you get it basically this distribution is uncertainty, so it doesn't need that much, uh, that bigger samples, right? So, so yes, that's basically, I mean, it's the difference between maximum likelihood and, and Bayesian analysis. Like, you know, maximum likelihood analysis, you get a point estimate, and then there are some ways to get some sort of confidence intervals, but you get a point estimate. That's your prediction. In regular machine learning, you get a single value here or a single uh, choice, basically, uh, in a classification task. Boom, it's a panda, that's it. In a Bayesian framework, you get by construction, by the algorithms that you're using, you get a credible interval around your estimates. So if you have fewer data, this will be reflected in wider credible intervals. And this is true for Bayesian neural networks, but for, for any other model, basically. Little data means more uncertainty in a Bayesian model, which is why we use Bayesian models, uh, and particularly so with small data sets. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay, thank you. But but so these BNNs are basically more uh, better for uh, classification. So it's, uh, if in analogy, it's like uh, supervised machine learning, right? Well, the, are there other ways a, to do this it? This is a regression task, right? Okay. This is a regression task. Uh, yes, I'll give you an example of a non supervised uh, BNN uh, in the last. Uh, Few minutes if you oh, okay cool it's yeah, fascinating thank you mm. um good yeah i would basically if uh, or is is there any other question otherwise i would uh, show you a couple of examples of things that we uh use bnns for um then I'll start, and then if you guys have questions, you just interrupt. Um, so one application where we've used uh, a Bayesian neural network is um, in a context of conservation or computational conservation biology, you would probably say. So you probably know that there is this uh, red list that classifies organisms for their extinction risk. It's compiled by the IUCN. Uh, and so the red list basically takes every species of animal or plant and tries to define whether they are endangered or not, to what level they are endangered, at risk of extinction. And this is great if you are interested in mammals and birds because they are all assessed by the IUCN. But if you are interested in other organisms, this red list is very incomplete. Okay, So there is very little known about plants, even less about uh, invertebrates, and even less about fungi. So here we use Bayesian neural networks to make predictions of these classes. So these are classification tasks. And uh, as predictors, we use basically data coming from GBIF, that is like occurrence, biological occurrence data that spans like many more species than the IUCN red list. And you can take these occurrences basically and turn them into features that enter a neural network. And then you can use these occurrence records, which will kind of approximate the, the range size of a species, how many individuals of the species um, there are, and so on. But you will take these occurrence records, feed them into a network, and then get as an output uh, a prediction of their extinction risk. And so you can train the model with the red list that already exists, and then apply to the other species that are not yet classified but for which occurrence record can be found. And for example, we did this on plants in Madagascar. Uh, and out there were, the IUCN has assessed 4,000 plant species in Madagascar. Using this model, we were able to add uh, additionally 5,000 species. So we more than doubled the amount of species that have at least an approximation of their predicted ex uh, extinction risk. And in some cases, this will be like qualitatively different. So for example, for ferns, only 3% of, of the assessed one were, not, were estimated to be at risk of extinction. Whereas with our BNN predictions, we get between 38 and 57% that are at risk of extinction. 
So this changes like qualitatively, you know, the picture. And because we feed the BNN, we get a credible interval because we get um, we because we run a Bayesian neural network. We don't get a point estimate. We don't get a single classification for one species for every species, but we get a distribution of classifications for each species. So we can tell that between 38 and 57 percent of all species are threatened among ferns in Madagascar. There are also cases where we use these Bayesian modeling uh, networks in a non-supervised approach. For example, we have a model that is uh, used that looks at fossil data to estimate parameters of speciation and distinction rates. Basically, they quantify looking at the fossil record of a clade, for example, mammals. They try to estimate these models estimate uh, how speciation and distinction rates change over time, like how fast species uh, diversify and how quickly species go extinct. And these are these are models that are implemented in a Bayesian framework. Um, but uh, we can also use neural networks here to try and link changes to speciation of speciation and distinction rates to particular uh, things, for example, traits as like phenotypic traits of the species. Uh, temporal events and things like that. So here the likelihood is not that of a classification or that of a regression. So the likelihood functions are completely different. They're based on Poisson and Perth stochastic processes. So it's like completely different context, but we can still use neural networks to um, make the connection between some predictors and the parameters of this model. The parameters of this model are speciation and extinction rates. And we can make the speciation or the extinction rate a function, but a non-linear function of a number of things. So the speciation rate could be a function of climate, time, some traits, diet, overlap with humans. And so, because we don't know a priori what types of interactions or what type of responses these things may have on the speciation and distinction rate, we use a neural network here. And this is unsupervised because we don't know the ground truth, but we can calculate for any given lambda here or for any given speciation and extinction rate, we can calculate the likelihood of our data. And so we, uh, we run this model to estimate uh, speciation and extinction rates indirectly as a function of, of this network. And what we found, for example, for elephants, elephants are an interesting case because they've been around for a long time. They have a very good fossil record, uh, but the diversity dropped very quickly, very recently. So until a few million years ago, there were between 20 and 30 elephants, elephant species roaming uh, across all continents almost all continents, except Antarctica and Australia. Uh, now there is three species, only two continents. Um, and so if we are to try and find out why they diversified the way they did, we can use these types of models uh, and correlate speciation and extinction rates with specific traits and events uh, for elephants, which in, in the case of elephants was in diet and traits overlap with humans and climate. And what we found is that there are non-linear complex relationships between traits and diet that explain uh, speciation rates, and that humans basically are the one predictor for the extinction of elephants, uh, which kind of didn't surprise us too much, but our model was able to quantify that the 8, eight to 20-fold increase in extinction rate linked to humans. So this is another example of using a Bayesian network inside a non-supervised uh, non model. And I hope this wasn't just confusing, uh, but that was uh, kind of what I had for today. Thanks for listening. Do you um, have questions? Yeah, yes. um, I'm, I'm not sure I really understood how you find the weights if it's unsupervised. Uh, yes, that's a, that's a good question. So our model uh, is using, without a network, basically, is using uh, our, uh, the, the observed fossil record to estimate some sampling rates, basically, and the speciation and extinction rates. 
And so for any given um, speciation decision rate and fossil data, we can calculate the like, or we can calculate the likelihood of any of the fossil data given any combination of preservation rates and speciation decision rates. Okay, so that's the likelihood. It's unsupervised because we don't know the true speciation extinction rates. But we can use, so this is like a regular likelihood uh, approach where we basically, we have the data, we, we have a likelihood function that tell us what's the probability of observing this data given a, at this point in time, for example, given this preservation rate and these uh, speciation extinction rates. And these likelihoods and prior functions are based on these Poisson and Bird test processes. So here we use the network to basically modulate how speciation and extinction rates change over time and across species. And the network will only basically spit out a particular speciation rate at any, for a given species at a given point in time. And given this value, we can compute the likelihood of our data. Does this uh, clarify a bit? I mean, in most evolutionary biology, models are unsupervised in a sense because we never know the ground truth, right? Every time you go back in time a few million years, then, then there is no ground truth anymore. And the same applies to uh, phylogenetic inference, where we try to estimate the phylogenetic tree connecting, phylogenetic relationships connecting species. We estimate them based on a likelihood that we calculate, but we don't know the ground truth, right? So we hope that our model is doing a good job. And so this is similar here, but the way to modulate the parameters is given by a, a neural network. More questions? Yeah. I, yeah, I have a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. And um, so they are about the classification case. And they both have to do with how to best interpret or present to people who may not even be used to Bayesian thinking um, what comes out of such a classification task when you have when you don't have a point estimate, but when you actually have a, a distribution. So the first question is, um, yeah, just how, do, do you have any experience with how you would make some kind of plot or table or output that will more guide people to think in this framework of, uh, we have, um, we have probabilities for each class rather than a hard assignment to a class. So this is, you know, one of my real life issues. That in the in the end, the people who read what I ask, but they, in the end, all they're interested in is it this or is it that or is it that? Mm -hmm. um, how to communicate better that? Well, you know, it might be this or it might be that, and this is higher probability, but the other one is pe perhaps also not wrong because the probability is not that much lower. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if, if yeah. you have any creative ideas about that. I mean, communicating uncertainty is not always trivial because, <laughs> well, many scientists, I think, know what uncertainties are, but um, yeah, I agree that it's not always easy to convey this. Uh, for the case, of classification, you get actual posterior probabilities, right? So you can basically, in this case, I can tell that I'm like 80% or whatever it is confident that this diet genome and range size are associated with the brown pairs. Mm. So you actually have a number. And if you want, you can use uh, thresholds. So what, what I did in some cases uh, is to set thresholds, basically, or for example, using a test set, you can set thresholds under which uh, you are not confident in any classification. And if you have a test set, so if you set aside a bunch of your data, uh, you can say like, okay, if I take, if I just take the one, the prediction with the highest probability, whichever the probability is, even if it's like 40%, then I will have a certain predi prediction error, 
in my test set. But I will do predictions for all of my samples. But if I say my threshold for accepting a prediction is 90%, for example, then maybe my prediction error drops to 1%. So I, I'm more confident. But that could also mean that every time I don't get a 90% post zero probability for a class, then I refuse to do the prediction. Meaning that you have a thousand data points, you make predictions maybe only for half of them. But for that half, you are very confident. And then for the others, you you don't do the classification. And that's, I think, something that you can do with a BNN because it gives you these post zero probabilities. You can just say, like, any outcome that is below whatever 90% post zero probability, I will not consider. Yeah. And then I have another question also about this classification task. Um, what, what actually happens if you have a setup where say you have three classes, you have a small number of classes like here in this example, but um, some of them say two of them are very close, say they are a brown bear and a black bear. And one of mm -hmm. them is very far removed, let's say um, it is a mouse. Then what I would expect is that, okay, you will probably get a lot of cases where it's kind of uncertain between the brown bear and the black bear, if it's one of those. And it's usually very certain when it's the mouse. So then if you use something like you just said with a threshold, then it will miss a lot of the bears because it's very often very uncertain and you will just say, we don't mm. know what it is, but actually you do know something. You do know that it's a bear, but it will just, it, in a result like that, it will just get lost and will say, I don't know anything. Mm. Do you have any, do you have any notion of how one could, one could deal with that to not lose all of this mm. information that yeah. it's actually not a mouse? Yes. So first of all, you can calculate the accuracy per category, right? So we've seen the confusion matrix. You can you can basically look at each row here and produce an accuracy. So here, my accuracy for pandas is 100%. The accuracy for uh, brown bears is 90%. And the accuracy for um, black bears is, I don't know, whatever percent. From the training data where you know. Yes. Yeah. So yes, it, it always yeah from your test set, right? So you can tell what the what the prediction accuracy is for every class. If you have a case as you say where like for example here pandas are very different from the other bears, and so for the other bears, what you will see is that the confusion matrix for this part of the confusion matrix will be more fuzzy, right? But what you could also say is or decide to do is to summarize these two classes and say like maybe I have a 99% accuracy in determining that this that uh, a given item is either of the two bears here and it's not a panda so maybe the accuracy over these two rows is 95% but then I am not sure within this block I don't know yeah. so then and you don't throw them away but you can say like okay this is at least one of the two classes. Can you just add probabilities for that, or is it more complex? Yeah, or you can like you can you can calculate the accuracies, right? Because you can say like uh, here I have fourteen on one side and uh, uh, thirty uh, twenty three on the other side. Mm -hmm. um, you can calculate the accuracy, like how accurately can I separate pandas from the other two? Mm -hmm. And so basically, it's like doing a confusion matrix with only two classes, where here you put both be both pairs in one row. You can aggregate them afterwards, right, and calculate their accuracy. Yeah, and is it correct or is it not correct? Say when you when you are actually using the model for classification to add to add the probabilities. So say you you have your you have your classification into three classes and um, you still want to know that, but then you also want to know how how high is the probability 
dot um, my individual falls into one of two of the three classes. Is it correct to add the probabilities that were spit out from those two classes um, or not? Like, like, I mean, the maybe yeah, we, yeah, don't even, we, yeah. don't even have, we don't even have point estimates, so it's a little bit hard to know what that means. Adding I mean, what I would typically do is just to do many predictions because you can, because yeah. you have all of these weights. You do many predictions and then you collect them, right? And then you see like how many times did they categorize these species and, or these uh, item as uh, these species, mm -hmm. that species, that species. And then like you have these frequencies and then yes, you can sum them up, right? So 33% uh, of the times it was this, 33% of the times it was that. So 66% of the times it was one of these two. Yeah. Okay. So yes, that's fine. Yeah. So I wouldn't do it directly on the probabilities you get here, but on the sampling on the posterior frequency of the classification. Okay, yeah. Mm. Oh, all right. That is very useful. Yeah. Thank you.